Hello, everybody. Hi. Hey. Professor Musgrave? Yeah. Would these slides be on the um, be on my courses? Yes, they're in the test three folder. They're, okay. they're printable versions of what's on the PowerPoint. And the PowerPoint's there as well. PowerPoint's pretty to look at. Are you going to um, uh, post the video from our last meeting? I didn't. I didn't see it. Okay. Um, the, well, the answer is yes. <laughs> What's today? Wednesday, so Monday. All right. I'll I'll, um, I'll look into it after after class. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If ever I don't, just just shoot me an email so I can uh, I can hunt it down. I always record them, but they take a they take a while to convert, so I can't upload them straight away. I have to wait for them to convert. Sometimes I forget to upload them up if converted. All right, it's twelve thirty. We'll get started. So we're looking at hydration here, and this is the reverse reaction actually of one you you'll be doing lab today or this week, depending on which class you're in. But this one is where we take an alkene and we convert it into an alcohol. So this, in this reaction, what happens is we've got our, our alkene. And you can see the product here is an OH, where the double bond used to be. Now, if you look at the reactants, we've got H2O and H+. Now, remember that in some instances, we've seen these other reactions where we've got one and then two. This indicates that we have to use the Grignard reagent first before we use the H+. In this instance, because there's no 1, 2 here, then we can use whatever we feel we need to in order to get the product. Obviously, following the right rules and everything else that we need to follow. So in this instance, what I would say is that if you've got two things here, H plus and H2O, whatever's charged will generally be what reacts because that's going to be the most unstable thing of the two. So the way we handle the mechanism then is I have the H plus. Now remember that the arrows here are showing the direction of flow of the electrons, not where the H plus is going or anything else. So the arrow comes from the double bond here to the H plus. And what the story we're trying to tell there is the story of a bond forming and also a double bond breaking simultaneously. Now I'm not drawing in the rest of these, but the H and the plus will go on adjacent carbons, the carbons that made up the double bond to begin with. The rationale for the plus being here on the second carbon comes from the fact that it's now short an electron because we used that entire bond to form a bond with the H. But the pattern always goes H on one and plus on the other. It would have been um, two plus had the entire, because there are in that double bond, there are two electrons, but H only accepts one of them, right? And no, actually the H plus is accepting both of those electrons. But remember that in this bond, one of the electrons belongs to this, this C and the other electron belongs to the other C. Do you right. see what Co I'm saying? Covalent bonding, right? Right. But what I'm saying is that only one electron belonged to the C that's getting a positive charge. That's the electron lost. Okay. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, and, th and that one for one of the carbons, that's 
going towards the bond with the H. That's right. And that's why that's why we end up with a plus on the C. Correct. Yeah. Okay. In the next step, we have water which comes in to attack that positive charge. Now, if we look at water and we look at its polar nature, the situation is that we've got a delta minus and a delta plus on the water. So the electrons on the O are going to be attracted to that positively charged carbon. And that's going to cause the formation of a new bond. And that's a new bond between the C and the O. So now we've got a positive charge on the oxygen. Now, why is that? That's because we use two electrons from this oxygen in order to make that bond. So it's actually supplied both of the electrons for the bond. That's why it's got a positive charge now. You'll also notice there's always conservation of charge, meaning if we start off with a plus somewhere, we're always going to have a plus somewhere else in every structure. Otherwise, none of this makes any real sense. The last step, now this is, this is especially important in when we're talking about the movement of arrows, you'll notice that the arrow comes from the bond and goes towards the O, which is often to a lot of people counterintuitive. They're thinking, well, look, if you want that H to leave, why not just draw the arrow to be H? But the thing is, we're not showing what the H is doing, we're showing what the electrons are doing. And the electrons are going back to the O because the O is positively charged. And that way that O gets its positive charge satisfied. So now it's an OH and then we have H plus as well. So you can see this is catalytic because we start off with H plus and then we end back with H plus at the end. And this H plus can go do this to another molecule. What happens, what happens to the third uh, H that, oh, that's assumed to be there. Yeah, right. it's, it's a line structure. I mean, I can, I can draw that in if I want to or not, but that was the H that we originally added but it's not necessary to have it there. You can if you want to, right. I certainly don't mind if you, if you still include it. All right, does anybody have any questions about hydration? Okay. I feel like I missed something. What, what, what's that, Julie? I don't know. I mean, you're, you're saying it and I'm listening to it and I'm taking your word for it, but I'm not really understanding it. Okay, can you, can you tell me, well, you know, you're gonna to have to give me more than that, Julie. Yeah, I, I feel like I, because of the electrons, like, I feel like there's two electrons on every bond, right? Right. One on each side of every single bond. Yes. And, and, on, a, and on a double bond, there's four, right? Yes. Okay. So when you broke apart that double bond. Yes. You had, one electron that went to the H plus. I get that. Well, think about it. No, actually, two electrons went to the H plus, both electrons from that bond, Julie. That's what resulted in the positive charge so, coming about on the C. So if two electrons went to the H plus, yes. one electron would make it just an H, and the other electron would make it an H minus, wouldn't it? No, because... One, one of the electrons in that double bond belongs to the C that I'm pointing the arrow at. Would you see where it says hinge? Right. That, that, that C actually belongs to one of those electrons. It's the other electron that belongs to the other C, the one adjacent to it. So it's not really giving up two electrons. No, it's giving up one because one electron it keeps. Okay, that makes it, that's better. Okay. Anything else? Not right now, I guess. All right. So I just wanted to point out again, the direction of the arrow on that last step. A lot of people do want to do this. They want to say the arrow starts at the bond and then goes on to pH. 
And the story they're trying to say is, well, you know, the, the H is leaving. But if we did that, then the H would come off as H negative, which wouldn't make a great deal of sense. It oh, makes I okay. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, I see this, Julie. I think this might help. Uh, that third electron, that's what's being shared with the H, where you see on, on that hinge carbon. Is that right? Uh, third electron. Because you said one of them goes to the H that was on the top. Well, I'm just talking about I'm just talking about this second bond from the double bond, right? One right. electron belongs to the C on top, and one electron belongs to the C marked hinge. And then both of the electrons are used to form a bond between the C and the H, but this C with this marked hinge still has its electron, so it doesn't need to change its charge, but the other one has lost an electron to that CH bond. Okay. All right, any, any other questions? And these are good questions because I, you know, I, I really want you to understand what, the, what story these arrows are telling. They're always telling stories. Sometimes they're stories of love, formation of bonds. Other times they're sad stories of breakups. So in the end, when that um, hydrogen, at the, you know, the one you're telling us not to draw the arrow that way, mm. when they break up, they get nothing to show for it. Is that correct? They're leaving oh. everything in the relationship. You know, in, in some sense, no, in some sense, they're, they're leaving with what they had at the beginning. Because okay. the, H, the H has its positive charge, just like it had at the beginning. It's not the same H, okay. but we still have an H plus here. And right. the... O gets its electron back and okay. and it doesn't get doesn't have a positive charge anymore. Okay, thank you. I guess it lost its positivity, Rebecca. Bad breakup will do that to you. I guess so. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah, think of it like a did this first step, think of it like a door opening. Uh, and the C and the C where the bond is forming as the as the hinge and that second bond is being like a door. It's kind of like how I think of it. Okay. So now we can look at reactions of alcohols and, and this is where I, I tell you a little bit about oxidations and reductions and how to recognize them. We already dealt with one reduction, but uh, the, uh, the nature of oxidation and reduction is as follows. Oxidation is, as you might guess, the gain of oxygen. But it's also could be the loss of hydrogen as well. Both of those statements are pretty much equivalent when we talk about oxidation. Reduction is the opposite. It's loss of oxygen and or gain of hydrogen. And interestingly, you can see, see for oxidation that often what you'll see are situations where single bonds go to double bonds, go to triple bonds. And for reduction, it's the reverse. It's interesting that word reduction, you can see that the number of bonds is actually going down or reducing. So triple bonds, double bonds, single bonds. So that's often something you'll see, just as it's just an idea, it's something to look for when you're trying to determine if oxidation or reduction is occurring. The other thing we can talk about, of course, is uh, for alcohols, how to just determine if they're primary or secondary. And we know about primaries. Primary means the OH is on the end of the chain and OH in the middle of the chain means it's secondary. The way I like to think of it like second carbon, primary like first carbon. Any questions? When we're dealing, and we're just gonna focus first of all as on primary alcohols for now, primaries. With primary alcohols, there's actually two things we can do. We can try a mild oxidizing agent or we can use a harsh oxidizing agent. Now, this is what I want you to understand about these primary alcohols. And this is this goes for any primary alcohol. I can, whoops, sorry about that. It's going to redraw this structure here. You'll notice 
And I'm really just talking about the C with the OH. And you'll notice that there are two hydrogens on this C. That means that there are going to be two possible oxidations that can occur here. One for each of those hydrogens connected to that specific carbon atom. Two oxidations possible. So the, the way that it goes is, is what I've shown you, but it's what I'm showing you on the slide. And I'll just, I won't redraw what's on the slide here, but you've got the primary alcohol, you oxidize it once and the O in square brackets simply means it's been oxidized. And you'll notice that takes care of one of these hydrogens and we end up getting a double bond here. So the alcohol, the primary alcohol has been oxidized to a, an aldehyde, we call this functional group and aldehyde with the hydrogen connected to the C double bond O. If we oxidize it again, that gets oxidized to functional group of a carboxylic acid. You can tell here that oxidation has occurred because now this has an extra O it didn't have before. Does anybody have any questions so far? So the implication is that if we just hit it softly just with, we can oxidize it to an aldehyde. If we hit it really hard, then we can oxidize it to an aldehyde, which then oxidizes to a carboxylic acid. So the mild oxidizing agents won't put it all the way to carboxylic acid. That's right, it'll stop. It'll stop here at the aldehyde. Okay. Now, the, what are the mild and harsh oxidizing agents? Well, generally speaking, I like to just, we, we just really talk about two of them. We talk about PCC, pyridinium chloride chromate as being the mild one. And the structure is such that it's got this chromium trioxide, the CRO3. And one thing I can tell you is anything that's got metals and oxygens in it will tend to be a decent oxidizing agent. So things like KMNO4, K2Cr207, KClO3, anything like that is going to tend to have oxidizing power. Now you'll notice that in this instance though, we've got this funky ring here and this ring actually bonds to the chromium. And that's what that dot means. It's bonding to the chromium. And ionically, right? No, not ionically per se. It's, uh, it's using the electrons from the ring here to help satisfy the fact that it's electropositive. I mean, most metals want electrons. So it's actually using electrons from that ring. It's, it's, called, a, it's called a pi complex, but you, know, you can look that up if you'd like. But that's the, that's the nature of it. It's, uh, it's forming a a bond with that entire ring. And that actually deactivates the chromium and causes it to calm down. Now, if we don't have that funky ring here, we just use straight CRO3, that's going to be considered a harsh oxidizing agent. Now understand it still is oxidizing to the aldehyde, but then the aldehyde is getting oxidized through to the carboxylic acid. So the net effect is that by using CRO3, it goes all the way to the end here. It takes full advantage of the fact we've got two hydrogens that are oxidizable and goes in two steps. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. The PCC. Yes. Okay. I see the ring and the N and the H. Mm -hmm. Is the PCC just the ring and the N and the H, or is the PCC includes the CRO3? It's and everything. The minus. It's, it's, it's everything. Yeah. And you can tell by the name too, Julie. Pyridinium, that's the ring. Chlorochromate. So the chromate is the chromium part and the chlorine and chloro. is the chloro part. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. So you said if we just use CRO3, then it's harsh. Yes. Okay. PCC is mild. So PCC is mild, CRO3 is harsh. Yes. Okay. With secondary, I will show you some examples of these in a second. Don't panic. 
Secondary alcohols, you'll notice that the situation is you've only got one hydrogen on the C with the OH. That means only one oxidation is possible. So if you use PCC or CRO3, you'll end up getting the same compound, which is a ketone as a product. You'll notice the tertiary alcohols have no hydrogens on the C that has the OH. So with oxidation, <coughs> there's no reaction. Does anybody have any questions just about any of those? Yeah, the KMNO4 and the K2PR2. Mm. Yeah. I kind of stuck those in, but I don't understand where they. Oh, well, no, no, I'm just saying those are examples of oxidizing agents, strong Heart oxidizers. Or, oh, strong ones. Yeah. Harsh so ones. Like CRO3. They're That's just right. That's right. Yeah. And then what, what the only thing I'm, I'm get, trying to get you to see there, Julie, is that when you have a metal and you have oxygens, and you know you can say, well, that's probably going to oxidize something. Okay. I mean, oxidizing agents aren't limited to those, but what I'm saying is that, if, that those are good examples. Would that be cut? Would that be because they would um, dissociate in water and then leave that negatively charged group available for bonding with whatever you're trying to react it with? No, it's, it's, it's more about the fact that if you've got something like CRO3, the oxidation state of the chromium effectively is six because each oxygen is negative two. Right. And cr chromium with six means it's desperate. It's effectively six plus. It wants electrons. So it will grab electrons from anywhere in order to make, in order to try and reduce itself to a lower charge, something more stable. That's the, that's the basis of it. Okay, examples of what we just talked about, primary alcohol. So if we take a primary alcohol, we hit it with PCC, we get the aldehyde. Now you can include, you can include the H or not. So for aldehydes, let me write that over here. Customarily, People will often include the H on aldehydes, but we don't have to. So you can have this or, or this. And the reason people might include an H there is just to let people know it's an aldehyde. You know, I mean, it's, it just sort of removes any doubt about it being an aldehyde. And as you can see, if we hit the primary alcohol with CRO3, then it goes all the way through to the carboxylic acid. Now that carboxylic acid could be drawn the way I've got it, or if it makes more sense to you, like this. But they're both the same thing. Now, if you look at secondary alcohols, you can see it makes no difference as to which oxidizing agent you use. You'll always end up with a ketone as a product. And that's because there's only one oxidation possible in the case of a secondary. So only one product is possible. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Now on the test, there's no real mechanism that I'm gonna want you to show for this. If you wanna look up a mechanism, you can do so online, but uh, it's not necessary for you to, to do any mechanisms with this. It's a very complicated mechanism. It involves a lot of uh, metals and electron transfers and, and other things going on. And uh, I don't really wanna get into that. I think I'd much rather you be comfortable with the pattern, the oxidation pattern in this case, and knowing what the oxidation does. Right, the next one is halogenation. Now, this is the first example of what I'm calling an optional mechanism. Now, let me, let me be more clear on that. Let me show you something here. Show you a couple of things actually.
Come on. Okay, we've got that, and then we've also got, I want to pull up a test as well. Okay, it's going to take a little while to come up, but that's all right. So what you'll notice, it, it, this is the reaction summary. This is every reaction that we're, we're going to do in test three. You'll notice that a lot of them have stars beside them and some of them don't have stars beside them. And some of them have star and the OPT underneath them. Anything with a star next to it is something I think you should know the mechanism for. Anything with star and OPT next to it, it's optional to know the mechanism, but it could be beneficial to you. And I'll show you how it might be beneficial to you. So in test three, there are going to be certain reactions. You'll notice that there's spaces underneath all these. You can get a bonus point for each fully correct mechanism you do. And these are the ones that would be optional. So for example, uh, this, let me see if I can find it here. Come on. Uh, a dreaded pinwheel. Hopefully it won't crash. The list of optional and the mechanisms was in the problems test three, you said? That's right. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the page number in a sec. Oh, here we go, page six, Rebecca. Okay, okay thank you. So I, I, that's my recommendation. I'll wait, hopefully this will not crash. I, I doubt that it won't. <laughs> if it's been going for this long, chances are it's gonna crash. But uh, you, if I could have found one of these reactions in the, in question one, then you know, you could do the mechanism for the bonus point or not. You could just show the product and get the points that way or do an extra, do the mechanism and get a bonus point. So that's why, I'm, that's why I'm saying some of these are OPT and the halogenation is one of those. But yes, you have access to this. This is in the problems test three. If you do it and you get it wrong, do you get a point off or is it just, you just don't get the extra point? You just don't get the extra point, Julie. But I, I do like your idea. And I've, I've often thought about it, often thought about it. Don't do it. It's not <laughs> bad because now you're encouraging us to try it. So that's good. That's a good thing. Yeah, but, but the thing is you have to get it completely utterly right, Julie. It's all or nothing. Right, but at least we'll try, right? Right. Well, yeah, but don't don't BS me. Just, you know, do, no, put, I... put, put, something sim put something that has makes some sense down. I'm not impressed when people just throw arrows everywhere. No, I understand. All right, it does look like it's going to crash, but anyway, that's unfortunate. All right, going back to where we were, where were we? There we are. All right, so the thing is, I'm not actually going to go through this mechanism, is the bottom line, because it's an optional one. But what I will say is that you can see the pattern here. If you use the PBR3, then what it will do is re it will take that OH and replace it with a BR. If you use SOCl2, it will replace that OH with a Cl by the mechanisms that I'm showing you on that, on that slide. Does anybody have any questions about them? Um, like I said, I'm not going to go through them, but if you want to learn them, you can do it for the extra point. Some people do, some people don't. Now, I do have the, in the review section, I do have the full exercises for these, so you can practice the mechanisms as well, even for the optional ones. But yeah, that's up to you. I, I like I, I like to do it. I think, it's a, I think it's a good idea. People who know the mechanisms tend to do a lot better on these tests than people who don't, I can tell you that. All right, any questions? 
Okay, let's look at dehydration. Now dehydration is the reaction that we're actually doing in the lab today. And you can see it's the reverse of hydration. So we're taking an alcohol and actually converting it into a double bond. And we use a very strong acid, usually sulfuric acid. And the water can often, often forms on top, or no, sorry, below. It often forms as a, um, in the solvent and, and then it just sort of sinks to the bottom. Because alkenes, of course, are hydrocarbon. So they're going to float on top of any water that we get as a product. So let's take a look at the mechanism and you'll see it looks pretty much just the reverse of what we had just been talking about. Let me move this down here. Come on. There we go. So the only reactant there is H plus. So we're, there's no real mystery about what we're going to react with the OH. As I showed you earlier, O is partially negatively charged because of the electrons on it. And it will form a bond with the H plus. Now that means that the oxygen has donated two electrons to that bond. And then the bond can break from the C to the O, which leaves a positive charge on the C. And then we can do the reverse of what we did before and close the door. Remember we opened the door earlier. Now we're gonna close it and form a double bond by using both electrons in the CH bond which puts a positive charge on the H. Maybe you know, let me write in water as well. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, let me show you another example. I'll do the one that we're doing in the lab today. So I think you do need to do that mechanism is one of the questions anyway, isn't it? TM, I think that's it there, yeah, that's it. I do have a question. Yeah. So in a solution, would you have kind of like an equilibrium process of dehydration and hydration going uh, on? Yeah, you probably would. And yeah, I was gonna mention that you could possibly find a way using a specialized piece of equipment to actually remove the water as it's formed. And the, in, the, in the actual lab we do, what we do is we distill it, which means we distill the alkene off the water so that it no longer reacts with the water once it, uh, once it, once it forms. Because the alkene is generally much lower boiling point than the water. The one we make in the lab is actually, I think it boils at about 39 degrees or something a lot less than water. But yes, it is something that we have to be concerned about. All right, so again, it's uh, the H plus adds to the oxygen and then we break the oxygen bond. And we end up with this alkene here. Now I'm going to draw it twice and you'll see why I'm going to draw it twice in a second. Okay. They're the same thing. But what you'll notice is that the next step, if you look at the, if you look at the mechanism here, the next step is that the C H, the H on the C next to the C plus gets lost and we end up forming the double bond that way. So it's always the hydrogen that's on the carbon next to the C plus. So we've got the possibility here of actually forming two different kinds of alkenes. So this one 
would form that alkene where the double bond is in the middle. And this one kind of forms this one where the double bond is on the end. I wonder, I wonder if you could, um, I wonder if you can tell which of those might be the main one. Any ideas? Which one, one do you? On the left. Why, why is that? The one on the left? Yeah, why, why Rebecca? Oh, why is that? I'm sorry. Um, it has three carbons attached to it and the other one only has two. Yeah, that's right. So remember the SAIT-CEF rule that we talked about back in test two. The more carbons connected to a CC double bond, the more stable it is. So this is the one, this is the one that's going to be the main one. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't stress enough the importance of practicing these mechanisms. So doing these problems I, I showed you in the last lecture, these review problems starting out here on page 11 and just practicing those mechanisms and then checking the answers, checking the answers against the ones in this file, the, uh, let's see, the mechanisms for test three problems file and learning, actually putting pen to paper and learning the mechanism. Hearing me talk about them just isn't going to cut it. The only way you can learn about these mechanisms is to actually put pen to paper and draw them out. I guarantee it. Yeah, I mean, you can listen to my videos till the cows come home. It's not going to help you nearly as much as writing them out. Now, getting an understanding of where to put the arrows, that's fine. But you know, what's that going to take? Maybe one viewing of a video and that's it. That's all you should really be doing for that and then practicing with the rest of the time. All right, does anybody have any questions? Okay. So the next one, this, this one is definitely what I would call a optional mechanism as well. Let's see, alkoxide formation. So what are we doing here? Well, we're taking an alcohol, we're adding sodium metal to it. Now the arrows here that I'm showing you, and I'll try and be a bit more clear about it. It's hard, kind of hard to see in that diagram, but I'll be super clear here. Now sodium, you know, you know, has one electron in its outer shell because it's in group one. So what we talk about are these fish hooks, and a fish hook is the movement of one arrow, not two, but one electron, sorry. That's one electron moving. That's a two electron movement. So that's a fish hook. So how come you used the arrow before when you were doing the hinge and the one wasn't really moving? Oh, no, no, it was moving. It was it, but it, because those both those electrons were being used to form a new bond, Julie. No, those, those were both moving. It's just that one of those electrons happens to still belong to the, to the C. That's all. It moved, but it still belonged to the C. And that causes this bond here, once we add the electron to the oxygen, it causes this bond here to break and one electron goes on to the O, one electron below, goes on to the H. See, this is a good example of what I'm talking about. Because you've only got one electron moving, we're not seeing any, any charges here resulting from on the H, for example. On the O, we do get an extra a negative because it is picking up an extra electron from the sodium. So that's why we get this O minus here and the Na becomes plus. I don't understand that. Why is the H not picking up what? Because look, in this bond, the O belongs to one of these electrons and the H belongs to the other one. The H is only getting it the electron it belongs to. That's it. It's not getting the one that's on the O as well. If that was a double electron movement, two electrons, yeah, the H would get a negative charge. 
but it's only taking the electron that belongs to it. So in these bonds, one belongs to the O, one belongs to the H. The negative charge on the O is the result of the addition of an electron from the sodium. So it is actually picking up an extra electron. This electron that I'm pointing to here belongs to the O anyway. That doesn't result in any extra charge. Is that okay, Julie? Yes. Okay, so then we end up with this H dot creature. And because we've got lots of these reacting at the same time, two H dots can join together and we end up getting H2, which is hydrogen gas. So I'll show you a, I'll show you a fun video here. Let's see if we can find it here. Uh, so we're going to, uh, let's see. Sodium in water. So water is, has OHs. Here we go. Okay, sodium water, it'll do this one. Yeah. Bunch of idiots here. Let's see. My uh, lab professor actually, I made an offhand comment about wanting to see this. And he oh, was yeah. like, oh yeah, we got uh, Idiots. All right, there you go. Now, what's the what's the point here? Well, you know, we're using sodium here. It's with an alcohol, and what's it, what's happening in that video is the formation of hydrogen, which ends up igniting, reacting with the oxygen in the air to form water. But it's, it forms an explosion. It's quite an exothermic process. Right, so it does something similar. All right. Any questions about the alkoxide formation here? Again, that was an optional kind of mechanism. Ester formation. This one is optional as well, as far as mechanisms go. But what I'm going to focus on more here is how the how this reaction occurs. And what we're looking at is the reaction of a carboxylic acid. Oops, that's not a carboxylic acid. That's a carboxylic acid with an alcohol. So what's going on here is that when this reacts, the O part from the alcohol will join to the C double bond O from the carboxylic acid, and then we'll lose OH and H which comes out to be water. So the product of an esterification process is a compound we call an ester. There we go. With water. So that's the pattern. Now there is a mechanism for it as well. And you can see the mechanism there below it. Again, not something you have to you have to learn, but if you want to learn it, then you can get a bonus point when you see it on the test. I'll let you know, so kind of closer to the end here, exactly what kinds of reactions you're going to see, what are possibilities for the reactions on question one. But this is one of them. Same with the halogenation as well. That's one you'll see too. But I will, uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll list them all out for you in the near future. But this is the product of an esterification reaction. So let me show you, uh, why, don't, why don't you all try one here? Right, based on that pattern, see if you can come up with the products of this reaction.
Okay. I'll give you a minute or two. All right, that should be enough time for you to come up with something. So again, it's the OH from the alcohol that joins on to the C double bond O, and then we lose the H off the alcohol and the OH. And what you sh should have come up with is something that looked like this. It might not look exactly like what I've got here. It probably won't in reality. But the bonds should all be pretty much in the same order. All right, that's what you should have gotten. Does anybody have any questions about this pattern? Yeah, I got a, uh, so I, I'm not sure how I did it, but I got where the, um, the double bond with the O mm. was one C over and there wasn't enough C's on the double bond with the... Oh, hang on, let me see. Maybe I, maybe I didn't put in enough C's. Let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Ooh, see, I did put in enough C's. Oh, hang on, let me see. Maybe I didn't put in enough C's. Let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Ooh, see, I didn't. There we go. Okay. And then now, I got a less C on the other one. Uh, well, now, there's, now that's right on mine. See, I've got one, two C's here in between the O and then you've got that square. So you can see them there, there's two C's and then you've got the square. So that's, that's definitely okay. Whoops. Okay, so I'm missing a C. Mm -hmm. But you were right about the other one. I, I, I was actually missing a C on top of that one. Saying the oxygen come in the uh, in that third kind of level that you have here on the whiteboard. Mm. Are you saying the oxygen and the OH comes and replaces the C and the double bond with the O? Uh, the O replaces the OH, yeah. And the H that was on the OH joins with the OH that was on the C double bond O to form water. But another bond is an extra bond is formed. A new bond is formed, yes, but we're losing bonds as well. Bond. So, so what I don't understand, I guess, is one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. Yeah, we're not losing anything really. Well, when the O forms with the double O, okay, yeah, yeah. there's an extra bond there. Well, yeah, but we're losing the OH. This is all happening at the same time, right? I mean, if you if you want to see the mechanism, this is the mechanism. You can see it. the H plus joins on the C double bond. O, the O comes in, attacks the C plus, then it gets transferred to another O, and then we reform the double bond. O. I mean, that's what's going on in the actual reaction. What I'm showing you, Julie, is just a pattern, just a way to figure out what the product is. It's not the actual mechanism. It's just a pattern. We need to know the mechanism on this, right? No, no, this is again an optional mechanism. Okay. Again, you can get the list off page six of problems test three, the ones that are optional and the ones that aren't really optional. Okay, any other questions about ester formation? Um, 
Can you put it on either side? So like, yes, think of like, yes, okay. absolutely. Go, you know, that whole thing could be reversed, mirrored. Yeah. Courtney. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. You might have, yours might look like that. I mean, yeah, the thing was. is, I'll always know. I'll always know. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how they're arranged. As long as everything's in the right order, I'll know. It'll be okay. fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're not going to worry about the tests for that. We'll move on here to the ether synthesis. Okay. Now, some of this, some of the stuff I include in the PowerPoints, it's, it's because it's because it's in the curriculum document and it's here, and I've presented the information to you, but it's not on the test. Nothing there about chemical tests for distinguishing alcohols. But it is there. Okay. Ether synthesis. So we've seen reactions like this before. This is called the Williamson ether synthesis. And in this instance, what's happening is that the O negative is coming in and kicking out the BR. It's very much, well, it is an SN2 process. And this really only works if the alkyl halide or the alkyl bromide, in this case, is primary. If it's secondary, then we often get these other elimination products. You know, it's very similar to what we dealt with in test, test two. So we get that competition to occur. But generally, if we're using these primary alkyl bromides and we end up getting just the ether as a product, so this is your first exposure here to a kind of like a synthesis problem. So let's say, let's say you, your mission was to create this ether and you had to do it using the Williamson ether synthesis. Well, what I'm hoping you'll see is that there's really two possibilities for you to do that. we can make this one the BR. And make this one the O negative, or we can make, I'll do the same thing here. We can make this one the O negative and this one the BR. And I guess my point here is that the one you'd put the bromine on would be the one that was primary. Whereas if we put the bromine on this one, then it's going to be secondary. And the primary one is the favored one. So we would choose to, we would choose to do this by the top method that I'm showing you here on the slide rather than the bottom method because the bottom method would lead to a bunch of side products because of using a secondary alkyl bromide. Yes, they both lead to the same product, but the other one will lead to that product plus a bunch of other ones you don't want. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I just want to, um, I just want to sort of whet your appetite, I suppose, for synthesis, because we are going to be talking about synthesis a bit later. You know, we're actually going to be going in and, and discussing you know, how to create compounds based upon looking at a product and thinking, well, where did product come from? How would we make it, right? So this is just a sort of a appetite way for that. All right, does anybody have any questions about the Williamson ether synthesis? Okay. Another method for making ethers, and I've got optional here because it's not one I, I put on the test, but I'm putting it in here because it, it is a common way of creating ethers and that is to actually dehydrate an alcohol. So simple ethers are often made by taking an alcohol and hitting it with acid and heat 
and that allows for the formation of an ether. So this is good for simple symmetric primary ethers and most ethers that are out there in the world are simple symmetric primary ethers. Now often we'll also include some sort of, well it's called, it's kind of like a, a thing that it's called a molecular sieve and what it does is it sucks the water out as it's formed and that means that we get the ether as a product here. But again, it's optional, so you won't be on the test, but I'm including it because it is a way that ethers are made. And again, ether is uh, R to an O to an R, or C to an O to C. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, as distinct from an alcohol, which always has no H. So this is an alcohol here, this right. but butanol, and then this is an ether that we're getting as a product, C O C. Okay. Right, so since, since we have time, remember I sent you an email a couple of days ago, said that we weren't gonna have a lecture, or sorry, a Zoom session on October 26th. So I'm going to kind of make up for that a little bit by making sure that we use the time we have available at the end of other classes here to catch up a little bit, to sort of get ahead so that we won't have, um, we won't miss anything on, uh, on that day. All right, so this allows me to start with the ether mechanisms. So I'm going to show you a few ether mechanisms here. Uh, we're going to start with a situation where the ether is primary, primary. Then we're going to look at tertiary, tertiary on the ether. And then we'll look at primary, tertiary on the ether. Now, what you're going to notice is that this is going to, you thought you were done with SN1, SN2 when we did test two. A lot of you were hoping, I think, that we were done with SN1 and SN2, but far from it. We are now going to apply our SN1, SN2 knowledge to the uh, mechanisms for ether cleavage. So that means breaking an ether, in this case, using a strong acid like HBr to form an alcohol and an alkyl bromide. So you'll notice that we're going to start off here with something primary, primary. Is anybody unclear about what I mean by primary ether when I say primary? Okay, especially when you compare it with tertiary, you can see the, it's a clear, very clear difference between the two. Now this particular ether is what I would call asymmetric. And I'm calling it asymmetric because it's got different things attached to the O. They're still primary, but they're different chains. One's got a two chain, one's got a three chain. So that makes it a little bit different. So when this reacts with HBr, what happens is the H plus comes off to HBr first because it's a strong acid. And it joins on to the O, which makes, which is going to make this a much better leaving group when the Br minus comes in. Because this is primary, then it's going to be an SN2 process. But because it's not symmetric, it can happen from either side. Well, actually, in practice, it'll happen 50% of the time on each side. So being an SN2 process, it's going to be a one-step process, if you remember, back from test two. And that's how we get two of the products listed there. So if you look at the arrows, a BRC bond is being formed and the CO bond is breaking. And this is all happening simultaneously. As I said, this can happen from both, sorry, from either side. And we'll end up with the other possible set of products here. So we'll end up with four possible products out of all of this once all is said and done. Okay, that's for the primary. Does anybody have any questions? Primary, primary.
Now, the difference between primary, primary and tertiary, tertiary obviously is that what's going on at the oxygen with the carbons connected to the O. So these are tertiary, tertiary type situations. And as such, tertiary means that we're going to use an SN1 mechanism. And the SN1 mechanism is a two-step process. So the first, the first thing we'll do is put the H plus on. And again, that makes the O a better leaving group. And then the BR minus, well, it can't come in in one step. So what happens is that this bond breaks apart and we're going to do this twice, once for each side. Oops. And we get the carbocation and then the BR minus comes in. And we get our product here. So I'm just going to circle the products that we're getting. We're getting this product with the BR. And then we're getting this product here with the OH. That's when we do it from that side. We can also, of course, I'm going to rewrite this same alcohol, the same O with the H plus on it. It's not really an alcohol, but the ether with the H plus on it. And then we'll break it from the other side. And this will give our other set of products. So we're getting similar products on both the primary primary and the tertiary tertiary, but there's a difference in the way those products are forming. The primary primary goes by an SN2 process and the tertiary tertiary by an SN1 process. Does anybody have any questions so far? I'll just circle those other two products that we're getting in this one and this one down here. So there will be four products as well. So it all depends on what side we, we attack from here. So on the test, what are you expecting? Well, you should be expecting this one, a primary tertiary. So what you'll notice, what you'll notice here in the primary tertiary example, this is a good example because it shows you on the left side, we've got primary. On the right side, we've got tertiary. So if we get the bromine, we will, first of all, we'll have the H plus attacking the O to begin with. So the BR minus coming in on the left side will be an SN2 process, one step to give products. And then the right side will have a two-step process where the bond breaks first and the BR minus comes in and attacks the C plus, just like we just did. So you'll have to be aware of what's going on on each side of the ether, excuse me. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Now there's also going to be some side reactions that occur because we're in a strongly acid kind of solution and we're forming alcohols. These alcohols can react by a reaction we saw earlier today, which was the dehydration process, where the OH turns into a CC double bond. You know, the CCOH turns into a CC double bond. And I'm showing you here, there's a couple of mechanisms that we can we can do to explain this. 
Now, if it's a primary alcohol, then it can eliminate by what I'm calling the E2 mechanism, which is similar to the SN2 mechanism in that it's a one-step process. So you can see here the way that the E2 works. And this is the only mechanism we can use for primary. So just going through and showing you. So we're in an acidic solution. So the OH takes the H plus. We saw this mechanism earlier. And then in a one step process, we end up getting the double bond, water and H plus formed. Okay, it's one step though, and that's important here. Now tertiary alcohols can eliminate by either E1 or E2. So if you look at the E2 mechanism, it's very similar to the one above. The OH takes the H plus, and then in one step, we can form the, we can form the double bond. But tertiaries, E1, this is for primary or tertiary. And the E1 mechanism, and I'm just going to show you this because E2 obviously I've just shown you here. So we put the O with the H plus again, which is fine. Then the water comes off. This is in one separate step and we get the we get the C plus and then it can lose the hydrogen in a second separate step to form to form the alkene. My thought is, my personal thought, because you'll you'll need to be able to draw mechanisms for these side reactions. Since primaries can eliminate only by E2 and tertiaries could be E1 or E2. I just think it's best to use E2 all the time. That way you don't get confused. Now you might be wondering why the primaries can't react via E1. Now I'm going to show you why that is. So this is this is what's going to happen if we tried to do an E1 mechanism. Now, a lot of people do try to do this, by the way, on the test and end up getting it wrong, obviously. So if E1 So we do the first step and we put the H on the O. Fair enough, that's okay. But then what we have to do is we have this primary C plus, which is incredibly unstable. And it just doesn't form. So we can't use E1 with primary. Okay, so no E1 for primary. So you may as well just use E2 for everything. All right, does anybody have any questions?
Okay, so when you're looking at E2, and I'm just showing you here how you need to be careful with the mechanism, a lot of the time people get confused with which hydrogen is actually leaving and forming the double bond. But it's always the hydrogen that's adjacent to where the water is or the OH is. It's never the hydrogen on the same carbon as the OH, but I often see often see people doing that kind of thing. It doesn't make a great deal of sense, but uh, it's something that needs to be looked at. All right, I'm gonna leave it there. And on Monday, I'm going to go through what the test question looks like that involves this ether cleavage. It's a pretty major question. I think it's like 25 points. And it's a mechanism question, pure mechanism question. And you know, this, this is generally something people don't do that well at initially. If uh, people are going to not learn the mechanisms, this is one of those things they tend to not do so well at. So just, just be careful with it. All right, does anybody have any questions about what we've done today? Okay, well, we'll leave it there then. And I'll see you all on Monday. If anybody wants to hang around and talk for a little bit, they can. The others I'll see in lab in a few minutes. Dr. Musgrave. Somebody's trying to say something to me. Can you hear me? Barely. I'll just type in the chat. No, 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 I, you, I, I can hear you, just, uh, just just, not very loudly. Okay, I was just looking at next semester um, for Orgo 2. You're teaching in the same format as this? Uh, I, it looks that way, yeah. yeah but it looks like it's on a Tuesday, Thursday schedule, not a Monday, Wednesday. That's what I thought. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't have any control over that. I actually usually used to teach it on a Monday, Wednesday schedule, but for some reason they wanted to shift it to Tuesday, Thursday. Hey, I, I just do my job, you know, they, they, they handle the yeah. schedules and I just say, all right, well, I'll do whatever. No problem. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. No worries, Mariah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Courtney, Brittany, Keisha. Okay. Let's go. My question is for the test, um, how do we know which number corresponds to what? Because I was looking at the questions and it doesn't signify like is number one strictly like alcohols and what we did last class. Uh, let me see. I don't know. Let, let, let me see if I can bring this test up or if it's still Thank crashing. You. Here, it looks like it crashed. Okay. Did it. All right, let's have a look. See if I can bring this up again. Yeah, it did not like that at all. Gosh. Mm -hmm. uh, let me um, force quit it. Try this again. So what's your what's your question, Courtney? So like for number one, is that strictly like everything about alcohols and stuff? Well, yeah, it'll be reactions of alcohols, either reactions or synthesis of alcohols, one of the two. Okay. And but they like, could be in any order. And I'll be more specific about you know, the kinds of questions you'll get in number one okay. a little bit later. Okay, so like number one is the reactions and synthesis of alcohols. And then is number two like ether and then? Is, yeah, number two is ether cleavage. Ether. You can see it here. I, I will go through this on, on Monday. 
Okay. I just want to start like reviewing because yeah, like, okay. I don't know, I'm a little lost. So I want to know it before Monday so I can like know what's happening. Okay. Right. Number three is a synthesis problem. Of ether? No, it could be anything. Synthesis. Okay. Just in general right. synthesis. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Number four is definitely about um, epoxide reactions with alcohols. Okay. And number five is a, um, is a roadmap problem. Roadmap, okay. Okay, that's, that's pretty much the whole test. I mean, all the, they're all formatted that way, Courtney. Yeah, I'm sure. I just wanted to know because what I usually do is I put like the notes on the test so mm. I can like, study all the different types, but I okay. didn't know what they were asking for. So that's all I needed. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff we haven't done yet. Obviously. Yeah, I'm just getting anxious, you know. Yeah, okay. I know. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll, I'll see you later, you. Courtney. You too. Brittany, Keisha. Uh, Courtney asked my question because oh, okay. that was I had the same question. Thank you. All right. Okay. Brittany. Okay. <laughs>